Hey everyone, what's going on? Happy New Year. It is 2023. Man, it's crazy. First off, let me share a little bit just about life. So right now I got a four year old, got a one and a half year old. So New Year's for me and, and my wife was to have my mother-in-law come over and then all of us just sit around in the house, put the kids to sleep, do East Coast New Year's Eve at nine o'clock and then be asleep at 10. And that's basically what happened. So I, I don't know if this is what life is like forever, but at least it is right now. Um, anyways, I hope everybody had a good New Year's, good holiday. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to get into January. I had a lot of cool things that was coming up towards the end of the year. A big thing was our company's annual meeting that we did. Our company has grown a lot and it was really important, I think, for us to just kind of instill like, our mission and our, our vision of where we're going and our core values and what our focus is and to get everybody bought in and it was incredible. It was really, really awesome and very inspirational even for me prepping for all that stuff to get up in front of everybody and kind of talk through all this stuff. It was exciting and with that in mind, I was like, you know what? There are some things that I said there that I actually think that everyone could maybe benefit from hearing. So I thought for this episode, it wouldn't be like moldy stuff, but just ways that that we can achieve our mold goals, let's say, and where we wanna go, and even just other things in life. And there's like two big things that out of New Year's that always gets me. The first thing is that like apparently New Year's is the only time that we can make resolutions to do anything different. I just think that's so crappy. Think of it this way, if everybody looks at New Year's, they have New Year's resolutions. Now, do they keep them? That's a whole thing. Most people don't keep their resolutions. It comes from a place of us wanting to better ourselves. And then I don't feel like we necessarily, either have the tools to do it properly, or we put too much pressure on ourselves to do them because it's like a once in a year thing that you're allowed to do. I'm gonna talk about both of those things. I'm gonna start on this whole, like you get one new year and one chance to set a new path and a new track. And I think it's so silly. And maybe it's because there's not a cool word for like new year's resolution or a, a different word. Like it's new year's resolution. There isn't like July 17th, I just want to do something different. There's not a cool phrase for that. Think about your life like in a timeline, right? So you're born, you're zero years old. You go all the way through school, you get through high school, you're 18 years old. You get through college, you're like 22. And now your adult life kind of starts, right? For the first 22 years of your life, you're most people are probably not thinking of New Year's resolution types of things that have any sort of substance to them. We're not really like changing stuff or making like meaningful decisions in your life that's gonna have a huge benefit. Some people do, but I don't feel like that really starts kicking in until later. But then think about like when you're in your 20s, like how many of us are making meaningful New Year's resolutions when we're in our 20s that can actually have a monumental impact on our life? How many of us are really doing that? Your 20s are for going out and letting loose and exploring and all that stuff. Then you get to your late 20s, 30s, you're like, okay, now's the time that we're gonna buckle in. Usually this is where the majority of people start really elevating in their career or their passions or whatever it is, unless we're lucky enough to be able to do it earlier. And maybe your families are coming around this time and all of a sudden, all this pressure of New Year's resolutions and getting better hits harder. And I feel like it hits harder probably because we have more responsibility, we feel like time has passed, whatever. But think about that, so let's just make 30 years old to cut off. Let's just use that as a standard or a reference. Keep in mind, I get it. It could be a little younger or older or whatever, but let's say 30. Let's say from your first 30 years of life, you're not really making any meaningful New Year's resolutions. And then at 30, let's say you start like really thinking through things that can have meaningful change in what you're doing, make you feel better, make you a better person, like whatever that is. I feel like that all starts happening around there. So let's say 30 is a starting point for that. So I just turned 41. If I think of it that way, I've only had 11 years of actually being able to sit down and think about how I wanna move forward in different years. And I actually didn't start doing it till I was 32. I remember the first time I did it and it was actually like super empowering. It was very structured. I was there with a purpose. I was thinking through what I wanted to do. And that's actually is where this whole path of me going down this road started, which is about 10 years ago. So that was cool. That was like a meaningful decision that I made at a point in time. I had a lot of stuff going on. I'm like, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put my everything into this, into that. And then as the years go on, I continue to do that. So one year, a few years down the road of that, 
I sat down and I was like, you know what? I need to take all this knowledge that I've gained in my head now from when I've started this and somehow create a training program that can share it with people. So whatever. And that's where Mold Masterclass started. But that was a very meaningful sit down in December. That year, I happened to be sick when I did it. So I was sick for two weeks in December of that year. I was laying like up in my, in like my office room at this apartment that I had at the time, just like sick. And I sat there and I outlined all of Mold Masterclass while I had the flu for two weeks. I outlined the whole thing, which is... <laughs> That has turned into Mole Finder's method. That has turned into how we teach our inspectors. That has turned into what we inspect is today. So it's actually really interesting to say, I'm going to sit here and do this, and then here's what I'm going to do with it next. And it was, again, very meaningful, thoughtful decisions on how that worked. But if we say 30 is the time when we really start thinking this way, so for me, I'm 41, that means I've only done this 11 times. And who knows how long I'm going to live. But... Doing it once a year? Who says that I can't have meaningful thought processes and make meaningful changes and decisions in my life March 7th or November 12th or July 16th? Like, why does it have to be January 1st? And then when we do it, it's like everything we've been thinking for the whole year now gets thrown down. Like, here's all the things. And what happens when your goals are too big and they're not attainable and you don't actually set them up properly, which is something else I'm going to talk about here. But when you do that, you don't achieve them. That's why nobody ends up going to the gym after the first three weeks of January. That's why people are changing their diets and then it stops. That's why people say, I'm going to travel and do all these things, but they don't think of the steps it takes to get there. They aren't able to achieve it. It's done. And then what happens? My one chance to make resolutions was January 1st and that passed. Now I have to wait until the next New Year's to sit down and have thoughts like this. No. Why can't I think like this every month? Why can't I think like this every two weeks? Why can't evaluate where I am and maybe something I really thought through that I thought was going to work didn't work the way that I maybe wanted it to and just reevaluate that whole thing and start over three weeks after I realized it wasn't going to work or three months after I realized it wasn't going to work. When you think about it, you're like, wait, I only have, let's say I live until I'm 90. I only have from 30 to 90, 60 chances to make reasonable change in my life. That's it. In a 90 year life, I have 60 chances. That sounds like crap. That sounds depressing. It sounds overwhelming because each one of those chances has to be incredibly like monumental and actually have an impact because you're only taking one of 60 out of 90 years. I've changed my thinking through this a lot over the last few years. I don't actually go into New Year's anymore with like this whole like I'm going to sit down and do all this stuff. It's a time of the year when I do it. It's not the only time of the year that I do it. I actually do it quarterly. So four times every year I sit down and I go through this whole same exercise that people go through once a year in around New Year's. So now the 60 times from age 30 to age 90 for me is 60 times four. I now have 240 chances to make meaningful change in my life instead of 60. And I just think it's super powerful. I think that we have to get out of this thing of this is how I always did it. This is the way to do it. That's not how progress is made. It's like doing the things the same way that things were always done. That's not how progress was made. So that was just like the first thing about New Year's I wanted to throw out because while New Year's is really awesome time and it really is a time where we can make really thoughtful choices because we're almost like pushed into doing it. When we do it, there's a lot of pressure on it and then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Or, oh, this year's screwed. I guess I'll work out next year. Why can't I make a resolution to work out in January? But my resolution is just, I'm going to work out every day for the first week of January. What if that was your resolution? That's it. And then at the end of the first week of January, you sit down and you say, okay, this is really cool. Here's what I'm going to do next for the next two weeks because I saw how this went. Like, why can't you build it that way? Like, why do you have to build this huge thing and then not achieve it and then feel like a loser after you don't achieve it? So that's one thing. So now here's the second thing is how to actually achieve this stuff. There's a lot of stuff out there on goal setting and how you do it and you make them attainable goals and you make them this and that, all that stuff. I obviously have done that stuff over the years and all these different years that I've done it. And then last year, I came across a book called Traction. It's actually a book for business owners and it talks about how to take your business from a business that's alive and functioning and doing you know, relatively well or whatever and to give it the traction that it needs to turn into something that can change the world. 
That's kind of what it's about. The thing about it that I thought was interesting is it breaks down how you visualize where you're going and then take it back to where you are and then set out the steps of what you need in order to achieve those things. But before it even gets into all that, the first thing that it talks about is understanding your core values. Again, keep in mind, this is all like business focused, but I actually took this framework and we did this in our personal life. My wife and I sat down and did this. When I read this book, I read this book in June or something. And so we've implemented a lot of this stuff throughout that time period. I, I read it and thought through a lot of stuff for a couple months. And there's a concept in here called rocks, which I'll talk about at the end of this. And we actually implemented rocks for fourth quarter of last year. And we're going to be, and we're doing it again for Q1 and, and it's cool. So I'll, I'll tell you like what that means. But after I went through this, I sat down with my wife. I was like, why can't we take this? And obviously for a business, it's not like exactly apples to apples on exactly doing the same things, but like the concept of it. And why can't we do that for our personal lives? And then we look at our personal lives and there's so many like areas of our personal lives, just like in a business, there's so many departments in a business, right? Like in your personal life, there's your family, there's your health, the fill in all the blanks, there's your job, whatever it is that, that's important to you. And so I, I started at the top and I just basically looked at our lives as if we were a business. And again, the whole concept of the book is take a business that's working and turn it into something that has a really amazing impact, right? Like something that's big, something that achieves the dreams and the goals that you have. I have a marriage and a family that's working, so why can't I look at that and then turn that into something monumental, like that is just this awesome legacy that's created. Like, why can't I do that? So that's how we took it. That's how we looked at it. So I'm gonna like really just summarize some of it for you guys. And if any of it sounds interesting to you, you go get the book, obviously. Like I said, it's a business focused thing, but I was able to apply it to our kind of personal family and stuff and it was really cool. So the first thing that the book even talks about before you get into like what are your goals is you have to understand you and you have to understand what your core values are. Now again, it's as a company. So you have to understand what your core values are as a company because every decision that you make moving forward ties back to those core values. Does this decision align with who we are. And if it doesn't, then it's immediately not a decision that we make. They tie it to employees. They tie it to so many things. Is this person that we want to bring into our company somebody who aligns with the values of the company? If they don't align, they're not going to fit in the culture. And that's what creates culture. So now take this to family. What's our core values as a family? How are we going to evaluate the decisions that we make? If we want to evaluate ourselves and how we are performing, we can do that against our values. This then allows us to instill those values to your children because you've defined them and now you talk to them about it every single day. Every night before I put my daughter to bed, we go over affirmations, which are around these values. We say it every single night. She knows exactly what they mean. She says them with me. It's ingraining these things into her, which is important. We've decided that these are values that we want to have. And this is like the foundation of creating this legacy, right? Now you look back and when she grows up and she says, my name is Kensington Carr and I am a car. And as a car, this is what we value. This is it. This is just part of my being. That's super powerful. And that helps you evaluate new opportunities and it helps you evaluate relationships in the future and it helps you evaluate should I go on this trip or not if I got this other thing going on and how should I treat my friend when this situation comes up. All of that is getting built and instilled into her because we sat down and talked about what our values are and we define them and we always bring them up. So the core value thing is super important. It's like the foundation of all this. So for, for we inspect, we went through and I'll tell you guys the values it's, there's five values. It's empathy. It's being authentic. It's having integrity. It's being accountable and it's being driven. Those are the five things. If you're a part of we inspect, you have all of those things. And if you don't have one of those things, you are probably not in we inspect. And so that's what it is. And it's not only about how we work with each other. It's about how we work with clients. It's about how we approach projects. It's literally about everything. So that's a core value thing that took time. So from the company perspective, we actually had our leadership team go on like a one day out of office. We rented a little space where we all could sit down together. And we spent a whole day talking through values. What do we think that they should be? What do we think we're currently doing? What do we wish that we were doing? Or what do we strive to do that maybe we think we're doing, but we're not doing so well. Like we went through all of that and we had a whole list of things. And the book tells you exactly how to do this. I, I took the model of the book and said, Hey, we are doing this. This is what we're doing. You end up with a whole bunch of phrases and words and thoughts. 
and then you narrow them down to what makes the most sense and what everybody feels aligns with them. You could do the same thing with your family, right? This is again, so this is what we did. I sat down, talked to my wife, okay, what do we think? We talked through stuff, we're like, okay, here's our values, right? This is it, we've decided what they are. So the first thing that I you know, would recommend is when you do this, this now becomes your long-term foundation. This isn't about what I'm gonna do this year or next year or the next three years or five years or whatever. This is the foundation of who you are and who you are for us, like who our family is, for we inspect, who our business is, and everything that we do moving forward is driven by those things. And they don't change, right? That's really what they are. And if they do end up needing to change at some point, then we sit down and we talk about it. But honestly, that's not the point of this. The point of going through values is really understanding who you are and being honest about that and defining it and then moving forward. So that's like your foundation, right? Again, we're talking about New Year's, we're talking about resolutions. What if you make a resolution that doesn't align with your values, but you don't know it? So you're never gonna achieve that because just inherently in your bones, what makes you breathe, what makes your heart beat every day doesn't align with that, right? So it's just not gonna happen. That's why this part is so important. So from here, now that you know where you're at, now you get into some of the things that you see in typical goal setting stuff, which is understand where you wanna go and then create the goals backwards in order to get there, create the steps backwards to get there. So the first thing again that the book talks about is setting your 10 year target, okay? In 10 years, where do I wanna be, right? Now the thought of this again is that you don't actually know where you're gonna be in 10 years, but where would you like to be in 10 years, okay? This becomes your North Star of where you start driving other decisions towards. Now, this will change and ebb and flow as years go by. 10 years is always 10 years away. So if we start 10 years today, but in three years, we're redoing this 10-year evaluation every time. So it's always 10 years away. So this is 2023. So you're thinking 2033 right now. Let's say it gets to 2027 you're now thinking 2037, right? You're always pushing it out 10 years in front of you because your perception will change on where you wanna go and stuff. You can't set like a 10 year target and say, I'm never gonna change my mind about something. So you have to have it be flexible. But what it does is it makes you think about the different things that are going on in your life. And so for here, like in the business and where we wanna go, and we might not even know how to do some of these things yet, but it's somewhere that we think that we want to be and it makes sense for, and it ties to our values and all that stuff. We did that as a family, so 10 years, Kensington is gonna be 14. Oh my gosh. Zade's gonna be 11 and a half, 11. What do we look like then? What's going on? Where do we live? What do we do? What does our life look like? Where do we want our business to be collectively, right? You're looking at running We Inspect and then stepping to the side and saying, I am a husband and a father and I own a company, it's a different way of looking at it, which is really interesting. So we go through that process and we paint this picture of what a, a perfect life for us would look like. It's not very detailed. It's taking like the key elements. What does each one of those things look like in 10 years? And you look at it like that. Then this is where the book goes more into business. It then talks about understanding like a marketing strategy to achieve that. And so like, in the family stuff that didn't really align perfectly well, like a marketing strategy of what that was, but strategically thinking, okay, if we wanted to get here, if you're thinking marketing, it's like, what's my target market? What's like my process? What makes me unique? What is something that I'm very good at that we can explain and use that to project our message? Who are we trying to get our message to? There's a lot of that stuff like that. And if you're looking at your family or you're looking at yourself, you're setting personal goals, it's a little different, but you can adapt some of those things. So I would encourage you to take a look at it. Like one thing is what's unique about you that makes you different? What's something that you're really good at that you've proven that you can do, right? Like marketing strategy isn't a marketing plan. It's not, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and we're gonna post this and send emails about this and do this and that. that's not what it is. It's just like an overview thought, who you're talking to, what your overall message is, like that sort of thing. From the personal side, it's a little different. It's, I, I would be looking more inward, like what makes me unique? What do I bring to the world? How do I wanna share that? How does this tie in? So we started a 10 year, then you go to a three year picture, then you go to a one year picture, okay? Three years a little more defined. You can get a little more defined on where you're going in three years. So when I sat down and did it, I was looking at the different departments. How many people are in each department? How many inspections are we doing? How is our consulting working? How many consultations are we doing? How does that grow? Where is, where's our office? How big is the space? Things like that. Because now that we're closer, three years out isn't that far away, we can start thinking through a little bit more 
And I think that's the process of this is you get your North Star. It also has to drive to 10 years, like where you want to go. And now you get a three year and a one year. Your three years are like your mid path to get there. And your one year is like this stuff is happening next year. And you start taking those things and taking out the most important pieces and moving them down. So we did that for three year, then did that for one year, a one year plan. And the one year plan was a lot more specific. This is like every bullet point, every line item you could think of to achieve said goal right? In each of the areas that you want to do. For example, like my wife and I talking about our marriage as one of our like pillars of our family business, if you want to call it like that. We had this thing that was called, I forget what she called it. She saw it somewhere really like the concept. I think it was called two, two, one or something like that. Every two weeks we'd have a date night. Every two months we would do just like an extended weekend, like a third weekend and go stay like a staycation kind of thing somewhere. And once a year we, we would take a vacation. So it was like days, months, year, and it was a two, two, one thing. We're like, okay, cool. So this is a one year portion, very specific things that we're tying into our marriage goals. These are things that we're going to do for that. Right. And now we had that broken down as a general concept and same things with the kids. We want them in activities. We want them doing certain things. Like what do we want them learning? Where do we want them to be developmentally? This is where we want them to be by the end of this year. Like all this stuff, you break all this stuff down. You think about it, you go through it. So then we take the one year plan and we turn it into quarterly goals. Okay. So let me just take the example with the marriage relationship, keeping our marriage tight and strong. So we said two, two, one, every two weeks, every two months, and then once a year. Okay. So all of, so the two weeks and the two months are happening within first quarter of next year or this year between January and March. So what do we need to do? We need to look at a calendar and we need to say every two weeks, put it together. What are we doing those two weeks for date night? Stick it on the calendar. That's how you achieve the goal of doing something for the whole year, right? You say you like back into it, right? For the whole year where you do this every two weeks, it starts by getting it planned and put on the calendar for the first for the first month, for the second month and getting it done. Same thing goes with the every two months we're talking about, we wanna do a little weekend getaway. Okay, the first two months is gonna be, January goes, so sometime in February, right? The next two month cycle is actually gonna be in April, which will be next quarter. So we're setting quarterly goals, so that means we're only planning one little weekend trip during this quarter. Cool, what are we gonna do? We wanna drive somewhere, we wanna do whatever. And then maybe the annual goal of taking a family trip, like an actual vacation, maybe it doesn't happen this quarter. Cool, it's still on my year plan. I know that it's there. I have my quarter one, my January to March plan in front of me. It's not there, but when I start planning for quarter two, I go back to my year. I see I haven't done it yet. Okay, this is something that I need to make sure that I'm planning out and figuring out, right? So that's how we looked at it as you get into quarters, okay? And then you have all of your quarterly goals and you're gonna have a number of your goals. Now, this is where uh, a really interesting part of the book came in. There's this concept called rocks. I heard this, I was listening to a podcast of these entrepreneur guys and they were talking about, they were both talking about their rocks, like they both knew what it was. I was like, what the hell are rocks? <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, we had our meeting. We set our rocks. The other guy, the two different companies. He goes, oh yeah, we had our meeting like three weeks ago. We did our rocks too. We got them all set for next quarter. I'm like what the hell are rocks? So then I start researching like business rocks and that's what took me to this book. I was like, oh, this is where it all came from. So then I started diving into it. So here's the interesting thing about rocks. So basically what you do is you look at your quarterly goals. So now if you're thinking of a company again, it's all built around businesses and, and trying to establish and grow a business. It's like, okay, so you look at your company. First thing you do is you define your leadership team. Who's your leadership team? Typically it's the people that are the head of a department or a team or whatever, depending on the size of your business or whatever. So our leadership team has six people, myself and Corey, and then we have a few other people who are really are responsible and, and do a lot for us in the business, obviously, and, and they have teams and different things, whatever. What you do is you go through your quarterly rocks because they're not all gonna be like one specific thing. Remember, I said marriage and family was one thing, but there's also maybe something for the kids. There's also maybe personal goals that we have as well. There's different things that are there. And then you look at your leadership team and you assign them rocks. Now these rocks, they get no more than five. You can't assign any more than five things for somebody to be a hundred percent responsible for zero percent reason of not achieving them. This is, that's why they're called rocks. Like they don't move. You can't move them. You can't push them off. They are what they are and you have to do it. So you create these rocks for yourself. 
And these are the things that you 100% have to do in order to achieve your quarterly goals that you have set, which then roll into where you want to go for the year, which then roll into what your plan is for three years and so on and so forth. So that's what we did. Let's say, for example, uh, keep going back to the, the marriage relationship portion of it. Okay. We want to take these trips. Whose job is it to schedule that stuff? Whose job is it to handle the travel getaway solo, no kids time portion of our marriage plan? It is my wife's job. It's her job. It's one of her rocks. She's going to schedule. She's going to check my schedule. She's going to make sure everything's good and we will have that. It's not for me to have to deal with because I have other things I have to do. There's also family finances that have to get handled and not just day to day stuff, but planning and understanding like monthly budgets. I'm a very good budget person. So monthly budgets are on me. So if you look at my rocks, I'll have a, a rock that's around budgeting for finance, let's say for the family. I might have another rock that is maybe around getting my daughter into an activity. That might be my thing that I have to do in the quarter. And you look at where you want to go for the year. You look at the quarter on how that is like a stepping stone to reach where you want to go. But then you assign individual specific tasks to people in your family or your company or yourself that you can't change. You can't move. If they get missed, it's a problem, right? It's not like, ah, oh, I didn't, I, I didn't do that one this quarter. No, if you didn't do this, we have a conversation to have. These are like non-negotiable things that you do. It puts a lot of accountability on it, but it also makes it very achievable because there's not a whole lot of them. Like at the most, there are five things. Like you might have three, you might have two, like whatever it is. So we did that. We went through that whole thing and we did it and we have our rocks and we have what we're looking at. So that was one tweak on the whole goal setting thing. When I read through that and I saw how they built it all out and they defined all of it, I was like, ah, this is really, really cool. And I actually think that if we define it this way and we show it, then we can keep track of it. And then off of that came this concept that they have of a scorecard. The challenge we had on our first quarterly rocks, which we're changing now into this one, is that we set them and then we never really had check-ins. We didn't really have a stable scorecard that was showing us where everything was. So people, we said, okay, starting October 1st, these are the things that you have to do. But then we didn't really like circle back up until like mid-December and it became a lot of pressure to get things done because we weren't doing temperature checks on stuff. And if you apply that to your life and your goals, let's go to the relationship, parent night outs, the type of things that we're talking about, then it's okay. How many have we scheduled so far? How many have we not, right? If you go to the finance thing, the scorecard is, did we meet our budget in January that we set for ourselves, or did we go over? And then, so you're seeing these things and you're seeing your progression and what's going on. So it's an example uh, of the scorecard. And then you know, the last thing that I actually thought was really interesting, I didn't do it for the family. I didn't think it was, I didn't think it translated really well, but it was a really cool concept is this idea of an accountability chart. Think of it like a company org chart, but instead of just saying that Joe Smith reports to, you know, Jane Doe or whatever, and it's the little line of one person under another person, their names are in boxes. And then you see an org chart, it's just a bunch of names, has whatever department they're in, whatever. The accountability chart is basically the same like layout of an org chart, but instead of just their name, it has the five tasks that person is responsible for as they're in their role in the overall scope of the company, of the business. I thought that was really cool. So we implemented accountability charts. So we know exactly what is expected of us. And we didn't do that for the family yet, honestly, because the kids are a little too young. But when they get older, I actually do want to incorporate this into just our overall sort of life. We're going to be a small company, right? It's me and my wife and two kids. So we're going to have four people in our little family business. In your little box, instead of just saying your name, it says the things that you're responsible for doing. And that's what you're being held up to. That's the standard you're being held up to. Like think about it as a kid, like simple things. What are your chores? Like maybe one of your things on your accountability chart is you do chores or maybe you define the chores or whatever it is. It's like, oh, this is one thing that you contribute to the household business is you do the chores. And if the chores don't get done, we know exactly whose job it is. And it's on this piece of paper and it's on the wall. Let's say that you're a little older, your kids are a little older and they're going to school, right? Maybe they're in high school, they're in junior high school, whatever. Maybe one of the things on their accountability chart has something to do with their performance in school. And then you just have your names on there and these are the things that we're responsible for. There are so many things, it's so funny. There are so many things 
as just being a human being living your life that you don't learn very well because no one ever really teaches it to you because honestly, nobody really knows how to do it. But then you shift over and you start looking at like businesses and like, how do you grow businesses? How do you become a better person? How do you become more productive? How do you become more effective? How do you become a better communicator? Like you start looking at all this stuff. Why does all that stuff just have to be tied to businesses? Like all of those skills would be incredibly helpful in just your everyday life. <laughs> so I would encourage people, even if you don't own a business, even if that's not something you're at all interested in, I would start like looking at that stuff and say, if you really like, want to better yourself and this all framed around new year's resolutions again, right? Like I want to do things that are gonna make me better. Look at the, those people have done so much work and research and there's so much proven execution of like their methods being done over and over again, that literally businesses are taking and implementing to their entire business. Think about it. Let's say a fortune 500 company, like these businesses that I was listening to on this podcast, they're probably not fortune 500s, but they make a lot of money. And if those people are willing to take concepts like this and roll it out to however big their company is, that has a huge impact on obviously how much money they're making. That means that they trust it. And if they're continuing to do it, it means that it's actually been successful for them. The goal isn't you know making money or whatever. The goal is whatever the goal is for you personally or, or for your family, but take the concepts and move them over. And of course, some of them won't be 100% like line item to line item, but you can do a lot of it and learn so much and start implementing like an operating system for yourself that makes you more effective and makes you get to where you want to go. Whether it's your mold goals or your personal goals or your health journey or your relationship with your family or your kids or your finances or whatever, this whole concept, I mean, I guess you guys could like tell me if this is a waste of your time listening to this. Cause I don't really, I don't do a whole lot of these. I just thought new year's is one of these times where, we can really sit and reflect on what's going on and try to better ourselves. That's what a lot of people do. And I find this helpful for me and I have for a while going through this process. And so I want to share it with you guys, but just remember like mapping out what I just mapped out. Yes. You have a 10 year vision. You go down to three, you go down to one years and you, then you look at quarters and then you set your rocks You do all these things. That means that you don't only have one time a year to make, meaningful decisions in your life, right? We're better than that. We just have to retrain ourselves a little bit and change our, our perspective and our mindset. So that's why I got for you guys. Happy new year. This year is going to be a lot of, of really cool, exciting things on our end. That's going to happen. Some of them you've already been seeing one thing that we're going to be launching in first quarter is fundamentally going to change the entire inspection industry on how people are gonna be able to go through their own homes. It's freaking amazing. I'm super, super excited for it. I've been working on it for years and it's gonna be really awesome. When that time comes, I will be telling you all about it. But until then, have a great whatever day it is that you're listening to this <laughs> and uh, a great kickoff to the year and I will talk to you guys later.